Our first collaboration was this uh, the beginning of this uh, year, this January. And we talked about uh, a case where Jordan Peterson was ordered by the Ontario College of Psychologists to undergo mandatory media, social media training. I would love to sit in that room when it happens. <laughs> well, there is a very big chance that we are going to see what is going to happen in the room, uh, as uh, Jordan Peterson has said. Now, what is uh, interesting is that he was ordered by that to undergo media re-education training, and he was told that basically if he doesn't do this, he's going to risk lose, losing his license as a clinical psychologist. Now, anyone can understand that this is more a hit on his image because he's not practicing clinical psychology for some years now. And uh, what is even more ridiculous is that uh, this kind of training in social media conduct is supposed to be a training by the college's social media experts, and that technically is not a field. I mean, also to say that, you know, social media experts, is, is a, it's a bit weird. Well, also, if they subject him to like the unconscious bias training thing, yes, for and, example, it's already been disproven that because the test does not have the, the replicability of the results, because you can actually improve your score each time you take the test, because it's basically testing reaction time, that it's scientifically bunk. So if they adopt something like that as well, it just shows that these people have been captured not by the scientific method, but by our ideology. Yes, and also imagine uh, people who claim to be social media conduct experts who don't participate in social media. I do think maybe someone does need to talk to Jordan about his Twitter because I love the man. But he's writing in haikus and posting photos of that bloody stalk. I don't thing. mind. I don't mind. I, I, I think it's, it's slightly less... It is eccentric, but in a, in a, I think in more a way of, that it, it makes you thought. I think he's been... It gives you some homework. He's probably been more articulate in the past. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Well, he went to court and to the Court of Appeal and he appealed um, against uh, the Ontario College of psychologist. And sadly, two days ago, the court um, ruled uh, in favor of the Ontario College of Psychologists. So that was a really bad uh, move. But there is such a possibility, there is a thing such as the possibility of it turning as a boomerang against them. So I, I have the impression that he is going to turn it into a big thing. And he is going to actually win them. And they're going to lose badly. That's my uh, impression and my sense. But the question is, society is a bit challenging at the moment. There are many people who think that we're doomed to an inevitable decline. Are they right? Are they wrong? Ride the tiger. If you want to find, if you want to find out, I'm, I, I'm riding no tiger, by the way. If you want to find out, you can visit a website, lotusiris.com, and you can, for five pounds a, pounds a month, you can gain access to all our premium content and watch videos such as Symposium 33, where we are talking with Bo about historical inevitability. Bo is the person to talk to if you are interested in history. And we're actually examining the methodology of the claims that people make, the methodology behind the claims people make, when they're saying that we are either destined to, uh, to achieve uh, infinite progress and take humanity to the Elysium fields, or we are doomed to an inevitable decline. And uh, long story short, we're saying that methodologically speaking, both narratives are fishy. Well, it'll be interesting when we talk to a certain consolidator of prophets of doom that's coming into the studio next week. Well, uh, prophecy has a factual element into it. There's a factual sense, and I just don't think it's a fact. And if you want to see why this is, it's basic methodology basic talk about human and induction and about you know stuff like that by all means check it now uh let's see that this tweet from january 3 2023 uh, jordan peterson says to clarify it has been decided i either i'm either to submit to social media communication retraining or face a disciplinary hearing and possible suspension of my clinical license and the right to represent myself as a psychologist and if you see down here a bit he says, I'm mounting a constitutional challenge but have little faith in the remaining integrity of the Canadian judiciary. And I can't believe I am now faced with the necessity of doing such things and not believing they will work. So the, there's an issue here because at the end of the day, I have the impression that the, most, the, the thing that is the most thorny for his enemies is his 
outspoken criticism of the Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. And let me just give you, show you one tweet, remember, I remind you one tweet from February last year, where Justin Trudeau says, Canadians have the right to protest, to disagree with their government, and to make their voices heard. We'll always protect that right. But let's be clear, they don't have the right to blockade our economy, or our democracy, or our fellow citizens' daily life. It has to stop. And I think, actually, if you see uh, Trudeau's actions, this claim is entirely hypocritical and actually unreal. Well, he suspended the bank accounts of multiple people, not just involved in the truckers' protests, but who donated yes. to the protests. And the reason they were protesting was because he was acting like a draconian crazy person over the COVID mandates, whether it be the lockdowns or the vaccine mandates. So they were completely justified in protesting against this, and Justin Trudeau acted like a tyrant. And his response was, then stop, pop it. Now, what's your end game, Justin Trudeau? Lay it out. So this was one. Right there. Uh, sorry. It's all right. I'll do it. You're having trouble. Excuse me. Sorry. Can we scroll down a bit? Can I have the. Okay. So. He says that he is unwilling to undergo the mandatory training and uh, he is interested in filming it. So right now, I, I have the impression that this is going to backfire on the Ontario College of Psychology. I did see that Elon Musk suggested he live stream it in Twitter space, which yes. would be quite funny. So uh, one thing, just to show you something that uh, came here, uh, we have uh, just a slide. What I, th I, I think this training may involve is going to be this something like this slide, which says that basically microaggression is a comment or action, whether intentional or unintentional, that expresses a prejudiced attitude towards a member or a marginal group, such as, example, I believe the most qualified person should get the job. Well, clearly they don't believe that, considering they're going after Jordan Peterson for completely spurious reasons. But Yes. Okay. So, but ju just uh, wanted to show you that basically, uh, if you talk about meritocracy, you're actually committing an act of microaggression. Yeah, you're far right. And this seems to me to be uh, what we said before about harm. This seems to me exactly what we were talking about. It's the ridiculous extension of uh, the, the meaning of a word. And uh, they're trying to find everywhere and everything to be aggressive. So this is, this is where wokeness begins. Uh, now, let's see at this uh, court justice, the Superior Court Justice of Ontario ruled against Jordan Peterson, and they said, for instance, reasons for the decision. Overview, he says, when individuals join a regulated profession, they do not lose their charter right to freedom of expression. At the same time, however, they take on obligations and must abide by the rules of the regulatory body that may limit their freedom of expression. This case raises the clash between a member to moderate that speech. And they proceed to say some other stuff. But I want to say that this seems to me to be entirely implausible. How so? Because I can get the idea of having to restrict speech if you enter some professions, but I don't see how expressing your political opinion outside the clinic is something that is supposed to, that should be limited. Well, even within the clinic itself, unless you have all of your sessions recorded and you have your, uh, or even live streamed, and you have your psychologist mic'd up at all times, you're relying on the testimonies of the patients to self-report malfeasance. And Peterson has already had an adverse experience of that, where he said he was accused of sexual impropriety because while he was listening to a female patient, he was fiddling with his wedding ring, which he took to be suggestive. Obviously, she's a crazy person. But then outside of that, it's obviously, I think part of the reason why you're confused is because it's not actually meant to be a workable thing. It's just meant to be a standard by which they can arbitrarily persecute their political opponents. Yes. No, I'm not confused. It's rhetorical. Yeah, I know. No, I'm but I, I want to show exactly what I think is wrong with it, is that I think that, uh, that, they are, that they are using a language that has an air of legitimacy that actually what they're doing is far more pernicious. But it's not and about I, hypocrisy. It's about hierarchy. 
Yes, and I think that this is something important that we should always remember that behind the rhetoric people use, we, there, there are actions. And we should always compare actions and rhetoric. And very frequently, they don't go well together. Now, let's see in the, on the next page here, in background, it says page 3 of uh, 18. It says here, since at least 2018, the college has received complaints about Dr. Peterson's public statements. Some complaints have been formal but many were tweeted to the college via the social media platform Twitter and often involved Dr. Peterson's views on topics of social and political interest, including transgender questions, racism, overpopulation, and the response to COVID-19, among others. Um, according to Jordan Peterson, a lot of the people who filed these complaints have mistakenly claimed to have been his clients. Yes. And when you make a case uh, against someone, you very frequently you, you you have to you have to say who you are how you know them and what happened you have it's to not, demonstrate standing yeah, it's not like jordan peterson is a, a kind of organization that people who say something against him need witness protection okay? well, for it's, god's sake it's not even that it's just the boundaries by which the institution that is persecuting him has jurisdiction is only in relation to his clinical practice. What he says outside of it, if people claim that they've been upset or harmed or, or aggrieved by something Peterson has said in his capacity as a public intellectual, it should have no standing with the, it, it's the Ottawa, Ottawa board, correct, of, of psychologists. It, this, shouldn't, this shouldn't be a case, but they just want to arbitrarily persecute him because he's affected. I think it's the Ontario. I Ontario, the sorry. O Ottawa Court of Appeal. There we go. That uh, ruled in the Canadians, name your places better, please. I like their names. Some, they, they have a, an exotic sound. What, French? I mean, some of them are, are, are good. Saskatchewan, I like this. Bless you. Also, uh, yeah, they, they have good. Uh, my, my, my cousin was born there, so I have an affinity for that place. Right. Uh, also, it says here, between January and June 2022, the college received numerous reports about Dr. Peterson's conduct on social media and in his public appearances. The reports again raised concerns about Dr. Peterson's professionalism, including whether his tweets complied with the college's standards of professorial, professional conduct. And uh, they're talking about his tweets, and they are reminding a tweet that he mentioned about, about uh, overpopulation. You've opened it in the wrong tab, that's why. There okay. you go. So, uh, and they're saying that, sad, that he was act allegedly incentivizing people to commit suicide. And a, a clinical psychologist should never do that. And uh, obviously, a uh, you know, shouldn't do that. But if they had, if they look in the context of that statement, it, it's immediately a, a ridiculous accusation. What it just does here is he tells people who are playing the antinatalist card, well, if you practice as you preach, you will have to exit this planet. That's his, that's his message. He doesn't say exit the planet. He actually says, stop spilling nonsense out to people. And let us just remind this tweet from, from uh, January 3, 2022. He had a spat with someone called Roger Palfrey, who was saying, I disagree. Based on the record of human behavior, we're already overpopulating this small world. Any arguments I have heard for supporting such a large human population completely overlook the huge loss of species and ecosystem resulting from our absorbed abstention. attention. And Joe Bidson replies, you're free to live at any point. And he is absolutely correct, 100% correct. Because what this person is doing is like saying, well, we need less people. We need less people. People, we need less people. Okay? That's what he says. But at the end of the day, he is preaching something and he doesn't want to incur the cost of his suggestion. And I think that this is hypocrisy of the worst kind. And he is correct. Jordan Peterson is correct to show it. So how can this be an incentive? How can this constitute incentivization of people to commit suicide? It's actually an incentivization to cut the crap. Sure. Um, I mean, the way in which he would leave would be to exit himself from the planet and Elon Musk isn't going to bring him to Mars anytime soon. So the implication is for him to um, take himself out rather than encourage everyone else to do so. But it's also clearly half a joke. 
But again, context doesn't matter. Hypocrisy doesn't matter to people that just want to dominate the political. But they use this precise tweet to say that I further complain about Dr. Peterson's a tweet in which Dr. Peterson responded to an individual who expressed concern about overpopulation by stating, you're free to leave at any point. The further complaint provided a link to a GQ interview in which Dr. Peterson made a similar comment about suicide. Well, again, this is an incentive for people to stop being hypocrites. And when they're talking about anti-natalist stuff, they're proposing solutions that involve less people. They're actually saying, no, they, they want their behind to be safe, okay? But they want to play that with other people, so, with other people. So they can have the pat in the back and say and claim how moral they are at saving the planet. Right. Now, let's see the next clip, the next link, please. By uh Joe Peterson, he says here after the court ruled in favor of the OPC, he says, so the Ontario Court, court of Appeal ruled that the, the Ontario College of Psychologists can pursue their prosecution. If you think that you have a right to free speech in Canada, you're delusional. And we'll make every aspect of this public, and we'll see what happens when utter transparency is the rule. Bring it on. Right, and I think that uh, we can uh, watch uh, the next clip, please, from the interview he did with his daughter. Can I read just a couple of sentences from the decision so people have an idea of what's in here? It's linked below. People can read the entire thing. But there's parts, like this is how it begins. When individuals join a regulated profession, they do not lose their charter right to freedom of expression. At the same time, however, they take on obligations and must abide by the rules of their regulatory body that may limit their freedom of expression. That's just one sentence after another. That's how it starts. Yeah, yeah, perfect. It's a great thing to highlight. You know, it's, it's like, well, you have this fundamental right, but, well, but what? What rules? There's what? There's a rule, eh? There's a rule. Is that right? that the College of Psychologists has that I can't criticize Justin Trudeau on Twitter. That's a rule, is it? And if someone anywhere in the world complains about the fact that I've criticized Justin Trudeau, let's say, then all of a sudden that's a rule, even though it wasn't a rule. And of course I get to criticize Justin Trudeau, not only because he richly deserves it in every way you could possibly imagine, but because that's actually what freedom of speech means. So I have no idea what the court means by, you know, abiding by the rules. So yeah. the rules are whatever the bloody... College of Psychologists determines constitutes a rule after the fact, given their complete freedom to make manifest any rules they want. Yes, yeah. it's beyond comprehension. And yeah, yeah but, but I have freedom of speech. It's like, do I now? What do I get to talk about? Apparently, I can't even talk about the weather. So I, I, I just want to make one note to Dr. Peterson, who I, I very much enjoy. That I know the suits are part of his character, but he's starting to look like Tommy Lee Jones' Two Face, so I might want to drop that one. Okay, so what is unprecedented here is the retroactive implementation of this alleged rule. So, most probably, what happened, of course, there wasn't such a rule before, but they tried to mend, mend somehow the case and present it in a rhetoric, in a language that seems to answer to the previous rules. And he's correct that this is retroactive. It's after the fact happened. So after the criticism, suddenly it became a rule that you cannot express political opinion. And there was that, that's mostly what is the issue behind it. And this is very worrying for anyone who is in favor of free speech, if, even, in not, if you, even not absolute free speech. If you think that free speech is important, this is something that is important to, to bear in mind. Um, it, it's, it's really tyrannical. It's like saying, you know, you can have a, any kind of retroactive, anyone is guilty. Anyone can be pronounced guilty because if they deviate to any slight degree from the, the, this managerial gerial woke agenda, there will be laws or rules that will be applied retroactively. And I'm glad Peterson's fighting it. And, and it's not like he needs it anymore because it's not going to go back to his clinical practice because he's serving a much greater role as a kind of cultural father figure. But I can't really get outraged about it. Like, I'm, I'm, I understand why he's very frustrated as a personal slight on his path and uh, uh, on his part. And I really want him to succeed in this. But we, we shouldn't be surprised. I mean, this is the guy who warned about this happening seven, eight years ago now. 
and all of his predictions have come to pass. So it's just another in a long line of arbitrary political persecutions by people playing the friend-enemy distinction. It is, but I think that he's in a unique position to fight yes. this for several reasons. And uh, most other people don't have the means to do so. Yes. So he gets outraged for that as well, I'm willing to bet. So most prob- for him, personally, it's, uh, I mean, it depends how we conceive of self-interest. I have uh, the impression that he doesn't conceive of his self-interest just in terms of losing his license, which, you know, if wokeness, it could be reinstated in the future. I think he's more interested in the wider significance Setting of the issue. Precedent. And the reason is why, because, for instance, um, he does seem to have the ability to, let's say, have uh, good lawyers. He also doesn't uh, require them to require, he, he doesn't make his living right now from clinical psychology. Uh, he's very well articulate. And I think that he is in a unique position to fight this fight. But most people are not. And most people are likely to fall under this blackmail that the managerial class is trying to do that is extremely unpopular. And they're trying to create regulatory boards in, on each profession. And they're applying, even retroactively, a set of rules that is actually dominating ordinary people in their workforce. You could actually be found guilty of anything if you express your opinion in such a way that suggests that you disagree with that woke agenda. And I think that this is incredibly pernicious. It is a danger to our current society. Okay? It's a danger to any society that praises, let's say, public discussion because it actually hints that people will be blackmailed by the regulatory board members of their professions to not have a public opinion, to not engage in public and not talk in public. So it's like saying, no, if you, dis- if you disagree with the managerial agenda, um, shut up or leave. That's the kind of blackmail. And uh, let's uh, let us watch the next clip. Like, what does the average Canadian do to fight back against this? Get involved in the political process at whatever level they can. Get involved in the school boards. Get involved in the political parties. Get involved in local elections. Volunteer for election. Start start differentiating between the false government, state funded legacy news and actual news. If you can do that, even though that's become impossible in Canada too, because yeah. now Canadians can't get news. It's like, look, here's the rule, Mick. This is the rule. All responsibility on the political front abdicated by the average citizen will be taken up by tyrants and used against you. And so you either take responsibility for this, which means to get involved in the political process, or you suffer the consequences. Now, you know, a young person might be thinking, well, what could I do? And I would say, you know, that's actually not a good attitude. And I mean that practically, because what you will find if you're young, if you go volunteer for a political campaign, let's say, first of all, you're going to learn a lot. You're going to sharpen your political beliefs. You're going to learn how to put an argument forward. And then if you're competent and hardworking, you're going to find that avenues of opportunity open for you on the political front so quickly that you can hardly imagine it. And that's partly because most political organizations are chronically short of help and absolutely chronically short of competent help. And so if you step into the political arena, you'd learn to speak more fluently. You'd learn to put your arguments together. You'd learn to be more responsible. You'd take the responsibility onto yourself and strengthen yourself as a consequence. You'd keep the country on the straight and narrow, and you'd keep it free. And all sorts of opportunities would emerge for you. And so that's what you do. Now, people don't do that. And it's partly also because they're taught, oh, you know, the whole system is so corrupt that nothing can be done about it. It's like, well, if that's the case, you're in real trouble. And if it's not the case, Take advantage of the opportunity. Get out there. Do something about it. You know, you're a citizen. It means you have some responsibility. If you're a citizen without responsibility, you're headed for slavery. Simple as that. That's how the world works. Well, I, I fully agree with him because it seems to me that when we, in order to be citizens, we need to assume responsibility. And where, wherever we don't exercise, let's say, our civil liberties, and we don't engage in 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 public and we don't practice civic participation, what happens is the following. We have gaps of public attention and people ta- have huge incentives to take advantage of these gaps of public attention. They engage in practices that are 
incredibly unpopular, I would say. I think the woke agenda is deeply unpopular. It's incredibly unpopular. They are engaging in these practices, and the very few people who talk about it, they get vilified. Why? Because the people are not assuming their responsibility to a sufficient degree to get informed and actually get informed about how, how dangerous and pernicious and tyrannical wokeness is and actually do something about it. I think they should be able to do something about it in their own lives, but I also think that that is wrongheaded in the conception that everyone should be involved in politics at all times, because that is also another road to tyranny. I think there should be a insulated private sphere where people are not required to engage, even with our content, as much as most of them do, because they just want to be normies and live quiet lives. So I, I think this is actually a pretty important example of why the vanguard elite for example, Jordan Peterson, very much one of those, can set case precedent in tackling these captured institutions. And the rest of people who, let's be frank, aren't as well suited for the fight can kind of just get on with stuff. I see this, but I think that you are actually um, adopting the negative aspect of classical liberalism. Because if you focus so much on, on negative liberty and you don't focus on the other aspect of civic participation and you know, informed citizenship, there is no chance in hell that people won't completely destroy this sphere of activities. People will want to enter into your house. And by, by, by the following rationale, the, the personal is the political. What you do in your own house is, is actually a political issue. So let's enter your house. Yes. So it you seems to be me able that, to remove those people, that this is actually the, the, the unappealing feature of extreme classical liberalism, that it, if we praise only negative liberty and the extreme case of it, yes, we will end up with wokeness. Yeah, but okay, let me, let, me, let me frame it this way. I don't think people should be unplugged and underwear, but I don't think everyone needs to start a podcast and speak up because not everyone should be involved in the political fight in such a degree as to where they currently are being forced to. Of course, I don't think that everyone should. Uh, first of all, what you're saying is impossible. Not everyone can start a podcast. Yeah, I, but most the problem is that most people, w when you try to talk to people you know, individually yes. about how pernicious the, the woke agenda is, I'm sure many people are really hesitant in uh, accepting your message. That's, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. They're hesitant because they are vi they're not informed about it. A think, lot of people are still not informed about most how dangerous I speak to on, is. Most people I speak to aren't hesitant, but then they're just getting into anecdotes, so it's not. Okay, so well, ju let's just end with this. I won't say that uh, there's a survey here that says that three in ten say that Canadians say that Justin Trudeau is the worst recent uh, prime minister, and uh, it is very suggestive. It doesn't mean that 70% thinks he's the best. Let, let me just get this. Out only, only I think around eleven percent of Canadians say that he is the best uh, recent PM. But there is a problem that when you have thirty percent of the population, and you are actually contributing to a situation where people are unable to express their dissatisfaction with Justin Trudeau, that's alienating thirty percent of the population. That is not a smart move. That is actually a very tyrannical move. If you enjoyed that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, why not visit our website where you can watch the podcast live in full, uncensored and for free from one o'clock UK time every weekday. And while you're there, for as little as five pounds a month, you can get all of our paywalled premium content, such as this interview I did with Helen Joyce, author of Trans, where we debated whether or not post-woke, the conservatives and the TERFs can remain allies. Very contentious. If you'd like to see the rest of what we're putting out, you can follow me on Twitter at, at con underscore Tomlinson and the rest of us over at, at loadseaters underscore con. Till next time, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>